With great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Hey everybody, welcome into the program. Sorry about that there for <laughs> I uh, I can't explain it, but for whatever reason my headphones decided to act up there at the last second and uh just snapped off and so I had to finagle this whole thing around so that you would actually be able to uh to hear me and I wouldn't be shouting in your ear because I wouldn't have my monitor on. So, thank you so much for joining us on the program at the end of the week on the Friday. It seems like everything wants to go awry, but nonetheless, we are here and we hope that you'll bear with us on that. Before I do get into the main topic of the day, I did want to mention that we did have the Bible reading marathon because as you know, yesterday was the National Day of Prayer. And in response to that, there is a group that that I uh, have done a little bit of work with and, and volunteered to help them here today to go out and read a little passage of the scripture. Although I have to say, even though I'm always glad to get the opportunity to read God's word, regardless of the context or what's going on, because that's always a, a blessing, always an opportunity that I enjoy I got to say that this one was a little less enjoyable, not because of anything that was going on in the group, just because it was like 10,000 degrees outside. <laughs> and also because I was reading the first part of um, the, the, the first part of, of Chronicles. And if you know anything about the Bible and, and its structure, a lot of those Old Testament books start out with genealogy. So I was essentially sitting there just reading a bunch of very difficult to pronounce names, <laughs> but it was all good. I was glad to help out. I'm really glad that they, they were able to afford me that opportunity. I appreciate them and I appreciate them doing this. It takes about 72 hours to read the entire Bible, but they do this every year right there on the Capitol steps. Really cool event. I encourage you to check it out and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll come by when it's not just a, a long list of names. Although comparatively, when you're thinking about that, there are countries where you could literally be thrown in prison for reading the Bible out on the streets. Me standing out there in the hot weather and reading a book of names seems pretty, you know, pretty trivial compared to the, some, some of the things that our brothers and sisters in other nations go through. So that being said, we are going to go ahead and move on to some local politics. In fact, right now, we have, even though we weren't able to pull this off yesterday, we have Becky Gerritsen on the phone with us right now from Eagle Forum, Alabama. Good afternoon, Becky. Thank you for being with us. Hey, thank you for allowing me to come on today since I wasn't able to come on yesterday. So uh, go ahead and, and let us know What's on your mind? I know that one thing that we sort of teased at last week was the campus freedom of speech bill. If you want to go ahead and, and talk about that one yeah, first, or we can okay, talk about sure. the abortion bill, whichever one you'd prefer. Well, actually, let's just start with abortion since it's alphabetical and I have my list in front of me. Sure, why um, not? As, and I'm sure you talked about this this week already, mm -hmm. that the Alabama Human Life Protection Act passed with, uh, let's see, it was 74 to 3 that passed on Tuesday. It is now headed to the um, Senate. And we, of course, are very supportive of this bill, and we would love to see it pass the Senate with no amendment. Right. And I know that one of the things that was debated and, and hotly contested was that the Democrats tried to pass amendments which would allow for exceptions for rape and incest. And one of the big points of contention was that Representative Collins, who brought this bill forward, one of the things that she was saying is, if that happens, it undermines the core purpose of this bill, which is to establish personhood of the person in the womb and to use it as a challenge to Roe v. Wade. And if you allow for those amendments to take place, you're basically admitting to it not being an equal human life. And that's why it would kind of defeat the purpose of passing the bill in the first place. And so uh, am I am I framing that correctly? And, and do you think that, that the Senate will take the same? Exactly. Yes, that is exactly right. And that's a great way to put it. Um, 
Now, we had another bill that was in committee this week that I was not aware of that it was coming down the pike, but it is a born alive bill. So if a child is, you, there was a, there was a botched, a bill would do, would require a physician to exercise reasonable care to preserve the life of a child who was born from a botched abortion. Mm -hmm. Great bill. It passed out of the House on Wednesday, and we are just, it's been put on the House calendar. So we don't know yet when it's going to happen, but the next phase will be for a floor vote on the House. Okay. So with this uh, particular bill and, and the way that it would protect those, is it, um, specifically, is, is this a response to sort of the renewed, I, I guess, idea that came primarily from Ralph Northam in, uh, in yeah. Virginia, the governor of Virginia, essentially stating that if there was a abortion that was uh, botched, it, they would make the child comfortable and then they would talk to the mother about whether or not they would execute the baby or not at that point. Is, is that sort of where this stems from? Exactly. But um, it's called Gianna's Law. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the, you've probably heard of her, but I forget what her last name is, but she is a grown woman now, but she survived an abortion when she was a tiny baby. And so actually the sponsor of this bill had been trying to get this bill passed for several years, um, but this is the first time it's ever actually been heard in committee and passed out of the committee. So in so, other words, um, the, the law doesn't really originate from what I'm talking about, but it sort of got new life because of that. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. And it's Representative Shaver, a female, and and also co-sponsored by Representative Ledbetter. Okay. So big kudos to them. Absolutely. So it does look like, and, and I appreciate this as somebody that, you know, is, is fiercely pro-life, that the Alabama House and Senate have, have taken very serious this call to uh, end the practice of abortion and, and take life in the womb seriously, both with the abortion bill and the born alive bill, um, which yeah. I'm, I mean is just a, a basic standard of human decency, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate to see our lawmakers taking it so seriously. Me too. And there were some great testimonies during the, the first pro-life bill mm -hmm. from people from adoption agencies saying we there are so many parents that want to adopt these children. Mm -hmm. They're having to go out of the country to find children to adopt. And this is something that we can just change so, so easily. And I would like to see the cost cut down for, you know, for adopting a child. My niece is getting ready to adopt, and her and her husband, they've got to raise $24,000, and this is an American adoption. Right. But, you know, if we could change some of those things, there are plenty of families out there who want to take care of these children, even the ones who maybe have some physical dis disabilities. And, and you know this as well as I do. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope we're moving in that direction. I, I hope so. And I would love that as well. I have a lot of family members that have gone through that process. It is incredibly expensive. It's, uh, it, it's, it's very stressful. It costs a lot of money. And, um, you know, there are probably families that would adopt more kids that have already gone through the process if it weren't just such a strain on the bank account and a strain on uh, having to wait as long as you do. And, and mm -hmm. I think that a lot of these women that are getting abortions instead taking their pregnancy to term, even if they don't want to raise the child and, and give it up for adoption, would go a long way in resolving some of that. There are plenty mm -hmm. of families that, that would do mm -hmm. that. Um, Definitely. One, one thing that I did want to ask, though, uh, about the, the Born Alive bill, um, it, what's its status right now? Is it, it just passed out of committee? It hasn't passed the House yet? Right. It's It's been put on the House calendar, mm -hmm. which is when all the bills come out of committee, they just committee. And right now, the, the pile of bills that is stacking up to be debated on the floor is getting quite large. Um, but it is in that stack of bills. And then what the Rules Committee does every day at the end of their legislative session, they will look at the bills. The, the Rules Committee people are the most powerful people in the House. Right. They will decide what bills are going to come up the next day on a special order calendar. So they could pull it off of the regular order calendar and put it on the special calendar and it would get a vote quickly. Um, but right now it's sitting on the regular calendar. Okay. I am so sorry. I'm, we're talking about, yes, the Born Alive Bill. That's the status of that. Right. And now the regular um, 
abortion bill is in the Senate awaiting a committee hearing there. Mm -hmm. And that they have not released their the bills that will be in committee this week for the Senate. I would assume it could come up as early as Wednesday, but who knows? They, the, right. the calendar is not published yet, so you just have to wait on the edge of your seat. Well, we will certainly be waiting with bated breath on that. So uh, anything else on that before we move on to the campus uh, no. free speech? All right, so so give yep. us an update on that one. Okay, well, this finally had, it was introduced last week, which is great. And it does have a committee meeting. As Actually, it's a public hearing. It's mm -hmm. scheduled to be Wednesday at 1.30 in room 206. And um, once usually when they have a public hearing, they vote the following week. They okay. vote on at the committee. So usually they'll, they'll not vote the same day as a public hearing. Now, there are some times when that happens, like when they did the marijuana bill, they did vote the same day. But normally... They'll have a public hearing this Wednesday, and then the following week they'll vote it out of out of committee or not out of committee. If they don't vote it out of committee, then it's just pretty much dead for the rest of the session. Right. It's it's sort of like a, a pocket veto where they just kind of don't bring it back up again. It's not that they vote it down. They just don't bring it up for, for mm -hmm. a vote or, or for a debate again. Um, so – with the campus free speech bill, do you have any idea about what the temperature is down there at the state house? Do you think this is something that has a lot of support, has a lot of people that are against it, or um, is, is there maybe some people that are against it in its current form but would be okay with it with some amendments? Well, you know, it's that's a great question. We have worked very hard with the sponsors and several national organizations to come up with a really good bill. And there's been a lot of back and forth. This has taken so much time and energy, but we are, there are actually 30 sponsors for this bill. So it's a strong bill. Um, and we have worked really hard to make it where the universities will not be in opposition of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, if we're going to try to crack down on universities, um, you know how they're, intimidating students or, you know, creating these free speech zones, they're going to be less likely to want to have someone come and tell them what they need to do. Um, so sure. we were very careful in how we did things, but I think for the most part, the universities are going to be fine. Um, I think they're going to understand why we're calling for this bill, but it will be, I can't wait for the hearing on Wednesday. It and and be very interesting. So, oh, and just a quick reminder to the audience, the way that this bill is written, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm characterizing it correctly, this applies only to public universities. So if it's a, a private institution, for yes. example, this would have no effect on their practices whatsoever. Yes, right. This is taxpayer-funded school. So your your Auburn, your Alabama, your UAB, yes. that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. All right. Um, I was going to tell you, oh, so if you know, and if, if any of your callers call in to you, um, to let you know that they have a student or they know of a student who mm. has had a problem on campus expressing their free speech. And, and of course, we're talking constitutional types of activities, not any of this crazy violence or anything like that. But right. um, to contact me and you can hook them up with me, Caleb, um, and let them know we would love to have them at our public hearing. Yeah. And, and if you do want to do that and, and get in touch with Becky and you, you want to do so through me, that's fine. You can always tweet me at tactics radio, send me a private message. You can email me tactics radio at gmail.com. So there's a myriad of ways that, that my fellow tacticians out there can get in touch with you if they do have a story like that. And I, I remember oh, one of the most controversial shows I think that I ever did uh, was you'll remember about two years ago where they had the white supremacist that wanted to come speak at Auburn. Do you remember that not at all? Not really. You know, that was in my grandma phase when I was really hanging oh, right. with my kids and not paying a lot of attention. <laughs> I do remember that, I actually. I had to take a break from politics for about a year or so. I mean, I didn't totally take a break, but sure. I really cut down on things. So Right, and I, and we understand that. But So essentially what happened is there was a, a guy that's on the alt-right. He's, uh, he's sort of a... Uh, a well-known national figure oh, by white Milo nationalists. Or no, it wasn't um, Milo. I think it was Richard Spencer. Okay. okay. It was either Richard Spencer or Jared Taylor, I think. So it was one of the alt-right guys, and they came to mm -hmm. Auburn, and a whole bunch of people got angry about it. And I mean, 
I don't blame them. It's a white nationalist. I understand being mm-hmm. upset by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they tried to run him off of campus and say that he shouldn't be allowed to speak. And then there was actually an Alabama court that got involved and said, no, this is a state institution and it's state property. They have to make the venue available to uh, all kinds of voices, no matter how despicable the speech is, because they can't discriminate against the ideas of the person renting out the space. And so Mm -hmm. it became a big hullabaloo. There were a whole bunch of people on both sides of it. And again, I don't agree with the guy's ideology, But I do agree with this idea that, especially when we're talking about government-run college campuses, this is supposed to be a place where all kinds of ideas, no matter how good or bad, are allowed to be expressed. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And that is kind of ringing some bells now that you've talked about that. Well, hopefully I didn't uh, butcher the summary of it there. but No, no, that was good. Um, so I I did also want to ask about this. I was, uh, seeing earlier and I'm guessing that you have at least some insight on this. Uh, there is actually speaking of schools, a religious instruction bill that it's trying to give kids, uh, credit hours for some kind of religious instruction program that they're a part of. And it seemed kind of vague to me. Could you kind of, uh, clear that up for me in the audience? Cause it sounds interesting. I just don't know much about it. Yeah. This is one of the bills that we're supporting. It's called the Alabama Release Time Credit Act. And what it is, and they actually have some some places up in Birmingham that offer Bible school, Bible classes, I should say, Mm -hmm. um, or discipleship. It can be Bible, however you want to say it, a Bible study or discipleship class offered during the school day that the person, uh, a student may go off campus and go to get this instruction. Now, there's a couple things that you're like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Okay, right. the school has no control over this at all. So this bill gives the school board, the local school board, the authority to say, yes, we will allow this, and yes, we will give credit for it like we would just any other elective. Um, the parents are the ones who decide what the class is going to be, or the organ, you know, they'll pick an organization, an organization could come and say, hey, we'd like to offer this. Um, The parents say, hey, I think this is a good idea. And Hmm. they have to give permission for the students. They have to provide the transportation for the students. When the student leaves campus, they are responsible for any insurance or, you know, anything. The school is not responsible at all for this child once and it's right, because otherwise that could become a real liability issue if a kid gets injured somewhere. And yeah, I understand that. Right. That makes sense. But there are a couple of great things about. First of all, this is constitutionally allowed right now. There have been Supreme Court cases, so this you could say, oh, well, we don't really need this bill. But what has been happening in the Birmingham area? They have a couple of organizations. Uh, one is called. Uh, I can't think of the names. I want to say Camp Hope, but I don't think that's right? Something hope. Um, these places offer this, and I don't believe they're, I don't know for sure if they're giving credit or not, but these are really great classes for these students, and they're finding that in areas where you have a high-risk population, you know, a lot of drugs and that kind of thing, that right. these kinds of programs are really, really beneficial. So we are in support of this bill. Um, again, it doesn't cost the school anything. And the parents are up to it. And if the next question is going to be, well, could the Muslims have their little Quran study? And yes, they could, because it's, you know, if it's a legitimate religious organization that wants to do this, then they're not, they can't discriminate. Well, and hey, but it's the parents who are going to say, sure, we don't, we don't want to send our kids there. Well, I, I got to say, as somebody who, you know, was raised as a Christian, if I were in high school and there was a place offering it's sort of an introductory class on the Koran or, or Islam or whatever, I might want to take that just if nothing else to learn more about it. So I actually do think this is a good plan. And I appreciate that uh, the way that they're handling it is sort of a the parents are in control of whether or not the student takes it. The local school board is the one in control of whether or not the programs are acceptable or not. And so I I really do appreciate that there seems to be a a great deal of parental control and local control when it comes to this, that they're able to do it. They're just not 
forced or required to do it or anything like that. So right. I, I think that there's a, right. it's a good balance. And another thing too, because you may remember in the past couple of years, we've had people suggest that we actually have a actual Bible classes in schools as part of the curriculum, which mm -hmm. I, I think there's pros and cons to it. And there's good arguments on mm -hmm. both sides, but a common complaint of people that are, are devout Christians and want their kids to know more about the Bible will make against a program like that is I'm not sure that I want the government in charge of teaching my kids about religion. Which mm -hmm. I, I understand or, the hesitancy the there. Specific teachers teaching about right, you know, right, right, and and, and, and yeah, so this kind really of eliminates that. that because it's it's a different organization that's not. So if if your church wanted to put on a program, presumably they could partake in that as opposed to partaking in a public school class around yeah. religion. Exactly, you got it. And I will be sending you my update, which just went out with a typo on it. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> um, but it, it did go out, so you can um, actually have uh, the links to these bills are in there, the status is in there, so if you end up wanting to talk about any of these other bills later in the week, you'll have info right in front of you for that. All right, excellent. And can I tell you one more thing? Oh, go ahead. Moving through. Um, we had a female genital mutilation bill, actually, that is one of our priorities this year. That was passed out of the House um, Health, mm, not Health. Judiciary Committee to this week, and um, our human trafficking bills, we talked about those last week. We are still right. waiting for those to be heard on the floor, but they did pass out of committee. So, Okay, the, uh, the female genital mutilation, I suppose, and again, you can correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong on this, uh, that one is a reaction to, there's sort of a ritualistic, what they refer to it as female circumcision in the Muslim faith, and, and that's supposed to combat that, I guess? Yes, it is, exactly. And we are finding just a growing um, population in our country that, of young girls that they're having this done to them. And so we just were trying to be proactive in Alabama to make sure that that is not allowed in this state. And so far, it, I, you can, can you imagine anyone voting against this bill? Well, I'm actually going to no. play devil's <laughs> advocate here and just sort of get your response to it. Um, why is this different than male circumcision? Because that's obviously something that the Jews engage in, and a lot of Christians, even though it's not religiously required, engage in it. It's uh, something that is born out of a religious conviction and people believe that it's something that they ought to do to their children as sort of an expression of faith. So what's the difference there? Why is it specifically uh, when it comes to women, why is that to be outlawed by the state? And does that run into a religious liberty question? Yeah, well, there are no health benefits for this. This, like you could say circumcision is, right. um, not only is it a religious thing, but it is a, a health issue. Mm -hmm. And for this, it is not. It is actually just mutilation and making the women be able to, you know, not enjoy things later on. This is um, and something that can can harm them. For, well, of course, it's going to harm them for life. So there's no it's only um, I really I think it's more of an oppression kind of thing. But. Well, right. I obviously don't agree with the practice. I was just asking that even if you disagree with it, shouldn't there be a consideration for the religious liberty? Because presumably this is something that their religion teaches they're supposed to do for the young girls there. Well, this this does not say anything about the religion or the culture that does it. There's no um, mm. specified culture that this talks about. Okay. So, well, I, mean, I mean, I agree with yeah. you. I, I'm not, I'm just saying that you, you have to play it from the other side and sort of yeah. reason that out. Um, so uh, do you, do you know a whole lot about the medical science behind this? Are there, you said there are no health benefits. Is there actually a health risk to the girls? Like, is there a chance no. that they, okay. All right. Nope. Just making sure. <laughs> but, yep. Um, and then what was the other one that you mentioned real quick? We got kind of um, off subject there and. Uh, the human trafficking thing, but we already... Oh, right. You may be interested in this. This, um, And we may have touched on it the other day, but there's a bill out there, SB 222, which is, will make all superintendents appointed 
Right. All county superintendents. Yes. I couldn't remember if we talked about that. Um, so that has passed both ho- both houses. Actually, I'm sorry. It has passed um, the Senate. It's gone through the House committee now, and it is just waiting for final passage, you know, for a vote on the floor in the House. Mm-hmm. And if, if this happens, then you will lose your our ability to elect our county superintendents. And, you know, there's people that have pros and cons about this, but our position at Eagle Forum is that to hold elected elite, to hold leaders accountable, the best way to do that is through elections. And, and I agree with you on principle, uh, which I don't mean the school principle. I just mean principle as in your values. Uh, but I, I agree with you in principle on that. But I also think that there's another angle to be taken from this, that the reason that I would oppose this bill as well is because I don't like the idea of Montgomery mandating to other counties how they do things. Like even if I wanted my superintendent uh, to be appointed and I thought that that system were better, I still don't like the idea of the people in the state house and Senate deciding amongst themselves how the counties are going to decide that. I think the counties as individual institutions should be able to decide, Mm -hmm. do we want to go with appointments? Do we want to go with an election? Mm -hmm. And that's how it is now. We right. do have the ability that you can, if you want to appoint it, you as a county, you know, your county can say, hey, we're going to take this to the vote of the people. And Yeah, and Elmore does that. So Elmore County does that. Well, we actually, yeah, we, we elect. We do not appoint. But mm-hmm. if we wanted to appoint, we could change it and right. do that. But this will take away everybody's, you know, who's now electing will not be elected anymore. They will have to be appointed. And there's just not a good vetting process. Um, I'm just not for it at all. There's there's no confirmations. Like if you were to do this right. at a higher level, you don't like have Senate confirmation over these people or anything like that. So although that would be help- when, when you have appointed people, you don't even know who they are or who appointed them. Well, and I, and that's true because the whole point of an election and the reason that the candidates pay so much money in getting their message out there is because you have to know who they are and know a little bit about them to be motivated to vote for them. And so you're right. A lot of times when there's an appointment process going on, a lot of people don't even know who are in these appointed positions because there was no incentive for that person to put their message out there and let people know what they stood for because it wouldn't have done them any good. And that, that, that really is a big distinction. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, uh, get it. Any, anything else coming up that next week that we ought to know about, or was that it? Well, this lottery bill could come anytime to the house. Um, it could have, you know, it's passed in the Senate. So, right. Oh yes, this is one, the last thing I'll leave you with. Okay, great. So, so far we're halfway through, through the session. We have 30 legislative days that we need to complete within like 120 days. We just had day 15 on Thursday. So mm-hmm. we're halfway through. The legislators have decided they want to speed up the process a little bit. So now, instead of just Tuesdays and Thursdays being legislative days, Wednesdays are now going to be legislative days. So they're going to, they want to be done by the end of the month. Hmm. And so if you thought it was crazy busy before, we're now going to three days of legislative time, you know, in their chambers with all of the committee meetings going on around them. So it's going to be really crazy. And if a bill has not even been introduced yet, you can probably just kiss it off. It's not happening this year. And they're going to be fighting over which bills are going to be coming to the floor on that special order calendar that I was talking about. Right. Um, So things are going to get really intense now starting next week. And more so every week as we get closer to the end. Yeah, right. Well, the education budget was passed this week, too. Right. Did see that. Uh, yes. and, okay. it, and it passed, passed bipartisan, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I believe so. It, it, it passed pretty easily and mm. it's going to be headed now to the house. It passed the Senate. So it's coming on down. So real quick before I let you go, cause I did want to kind of get your reaction to it. We've made national headlines in the state house mm. with uh, state representative John Rogers who I believe now, and and I've seen his statement on it, he has actually doubled down on the clip that we played on this show yesterday about saying that you either kill babies now or you kill them later in the electric chair. Um, What has been the reaction in the House to that? Has there been, like, did did it just become a big deal because it made national headlines, or was everybody kind of... No, no, no. Okay. No, 
while I was, I was actually listening at home, um, which is great because you can listen online to what's happening in the house. Mm-hmm. And I knew, I knew it was going to be like six hours long. So I was working on my computer, but listening to everything. And when he first, he, he said something similar to that in the beginning. And then he just started doubling down and he just, he saw, he just kept going farther and farther, which is crazy. But Mike Holmes said that it was, everybody just kind of guessed like they couldn't, even some on the Democrat side were, were not really happy with what he was saying, but he is not backing away from that at all. No, he's actually doubled down twice now mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. he did an interview yesterday morning, I think, with Yellowhammer News and then did another one with NBC 13. And in both cases, doubled down and hasn't apologized. Uh, I think even the Democrats that are pro-life, even if they actually share his beliefs, are sitting there like, no, 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 this is this is bad, mm-hmm. bad optics. Don't don't go any mm-hmm. further. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Yeah, it was horrible. And I just. He just really kept going. I would love to hear the entire, I don't know if anyone's blog sure, but the whole, qu- it's because he said so much more than just that. I mean, he just kept saying it in different ways and nobody wants these kids and we should just get rid of them. And it was horrible. It was really horrible. It it's, it really did. And granted, I saw an abridged clip. I think mine was much more long form than the sound bites that you're seeing, but it's still like, based on what you're saying, it went on for several minutes. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I think I've seen about a two, two and a half minute clip on that. So, Mm -hmm. but anyway, all right. Well, thank you, Becky. And we appreciate you keeping us abreast of the situation down there at at the uh, state Congress. We appreciate so much you, you know, making sure that we know what's going on down there. Well, thank you so much for having me. And if anyone wants to get onto our newsletter, which I send out weekly updates on the bills that we're watching they can go to alabamaeagle.org, and in the little Take Action tab, there's a place that says Sign Up for Emails, so you can go there and do that, and I will forward this one over to you right now. I Take think I already action. have that one. Is it the oh, one good. that... Okay. Yeah, Week was seven. it number seven? Okay, yeah, that I actually did get that one. Um, in Excellent. fact, I think that's how I found out about the religious instruction bill. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. So, so great. Products. Yeah. Great resource. I, I would encourage anybody to go to alabamaeagle.org if you want. That'll, that'll be something that really helps you stay on top of what's going on here in the state. All right. Well, you guys have a great weekend um, and we'll talk next week. All right. Thank you, Becky. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. All right, Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. Always a pleasure to have her on. And it looks like we've, uh, we're going to go ahead and go to a break, and then we'll come back and wrap it up. And now for a reading from the Social Justice Warrior Bible with Pastor Gregory Post. Welcome in. I'm Gregory Post head pastor at the Eternal Living Word Trans-Denominational Community Church and Coffee House in Nevada, California. And now it's time once again for another reading of the SJW Bible. Today's story is going to be about how Naaman was cured of his leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. And it says, It happened when Elisha, the man and or woman of God, depending on how he identified at the time, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, and he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horse and his chariots, which were sustainably raised and emitted no greenhouse gases, and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Not that I'm implying that you were dirty just because you were a leper. That would be leper-shaming. But Naaman was furious and went away, saying, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand all over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Paphra and the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him, saying, Wow, that Elisha guy is such a xenophobic jerk. Where does he get off implying that the rivers in Israel are better than the rivers in our country? That nationalist jerk probably believes in Israeli exceptionalism, too. So then God spoke to Naaman directly and said, Naaman, 
I am so sorry for being intolerant and not accommodating enough. I should never have asked you to have to go and do something to be cured. You believe in me, and since purification comes from faith only, I'll just go ahead and heal you right here and now. And from that hour forward, his flesh was cured, and they all went out to try some local craft beer. Wow, so inspirational. Thank you for listening to this reading of the SJW Bible. And remember, the only truth that matters is your truth. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for being with us today on this Friday. The week is almost over, but we do have more to talk about. And you may recall, we were talking about this just before the break, that Representative John Rogers has been doubling down on the things that he said the other day. You may remember the original clip that we played on the air where this guy was saying, well, these children that are being aborted, they're just unwanted, and if we we need to either kill them now or kill them in the electric chair, so we might as well kill them now. I mean, just horrific comic book villain levels of evil. It just uh, It makes your skin crawl listening to it. But this is a guy that has been in the House of Representatives for, I think, what, 36 years? I mean, he's he's been in the House longer than I've been alive. And he's not backing down. He had the opportunity to back down or walk it back or explain himself with an interview with Yellowhammer and didn't. Didn't apologize, said that he stood by what he said. I mean, just cringeworthy. And then he was doing an interview the other day with... NBC 13, which was a local news station, and uh, let's see if I've still got it here. No, that's the original clip. Uh, and and then this was the result of that interview. Earlier today, Donald Trump Jr. condemned your comments. Do you have a response to the president's son? Hey, that's an honor. <laughs> Donald Trump Jr. did that. Thank God. Right on. That's if you know I'm right. Because I don't know that he'd been right on since he'd been here. May, uh, that proved the right to make a city about abortion. Him being born, that's proved the right to be. That's a very, very good defense I have for abortion right to him. Look, look at him and say, why don't you, you abort him when he was born? He would have made that stupid statement, right? So, so his parents made the decision for him. Uh, that's the decision he made for him. So that's the first proof I got that mother had the right to have abortion. I had. They made a decision to have him, didn't they? They could have aborted him. But they made a decision to keep him. Because so he's evidently... Uh, Retarded. Uh, crazy. Donald Trump son, I know he's something wrong with that boy. I look at him and tell him something wrong with him. He said, hey, that's, a, that's the best defense I got for abortion right there looking at him. Well, there you go, Alabama. Especially you, Birmingham. That's your representative in the state house. And here's the really the takeaway from this, because for those of you who had a hard time understanding him, I don't blame you. I've lived in Alabama my entire life, and the guy rambles incoherently to where you can barely understand what he's trying to say. Uh, the, the guy is a communicator. This guy is not. But anyway, there is Representative John Rogers trying to make a point about abortion. And in this interview, they were asking about Donald Trump Jr. responding to what he said the other day in the house and him saying that to give a summary, well, that's proof that what I'm saying about abortion is right because his mother should have aborted him because he's, and again, using his words, not mine, retarded and crazy. Now let's go ahead and unpack that here for a second. Can you imagine anything less tolerant than saying that somebody who disagrees with you politically ought to be dead? Because the left constantly teaches about, or, you know, pretends to hold the ideals of tolerance and civility, and anytime somebody says something that is critical of them, that's what they always, they always do. They kind of do uh, what you see in basketball a lot, which is, even though the foul didn't necessarily hit them, or there was no contact made, they kind of throw their hands up and act as though they've been fouled, and they say, no, 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 civility, no, 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 tolerance. But then this is a Democrat saying, and, and there are others that hold the sentiment, 
This is a Democrat saying, well, Donald Trump Jr. really should have been aborted. He shouldn't be alive anymore because he disagrees with what I'm saying. I can't think of anything less tolerant than wanting your political adversaries to be dead so they're not alive to say things you don't like. There's literally not a way to be less tolerant. Not one that I can think of. I mean, maybe torturing them and then killing them would be the only one that I can kind of come up with, but just saying, well, they shouldn't be alive right now anyway. They should have never even been given the chance to live because they disagree with me. There's something wrong with them because they don't agree with what I'm saying politically. Ergo, they shouldn't be alive anymore. I'm really at a loss for words on this because the idea that you ought to just be silencing by way of execution people that disagree with you and writing them off as the reason that they disagree with you is because they're just crazy and and mentally insane. We've got to get away from this place to where having a disagreement with someone politically automatically means that you're mentally incompetent or evil because that's what happens a lot in the way that our civil discourse has been going the past few years is that we've gotten to this place to where if you disagree with me politically, the only two options are you're mentally incompetent. In other words, you don't have the brain capacity to see things my way. It's not that you come from a different background or a different perspective. It's that your mind is not powerful enough. You are not intelligent enough to see this issue correctly. Ergo, that's the reason that you disagree with me or It's coming from a place of, well, he's just evil. Now, there's a difference in referring to someone as evil based on their actions and just saying, as a blanket statement, anybody that disagrees with me is evil. That's essentially what happens now. Uh, There was a, a meme that was going around, I think, about a year, year and a half ago, and it was one of those little golden spine children's books. And it was a a political guide to, it was a guide to American politics. And the title of it was everyone I dislike is Hitler. That's kind of where we've gone to with a lot of this. And, and John Rogers just full on embracing this, that if you disagree with me, it must be because you're not mentally uh, adept enough to be able to understand my points. And that's the only reason that anybody could possibly disagree with me. But the larger point here, Because think about what he is saying. That because somebody is, and again, I'm using his words, so don't demonetize me on YouTube or anything for saying this, which, by the way, should be an indication of of that he shouldn't have said it. But he said that the reason that you should abort someone is because there's something wrong with that boy, that he's retarded or crazy. Using his phraseology, not mine. This goes back to the eugenics roots of abortion. And if you're looking at the arguments that were pro-abortion early on, especially when you're looking at the writings of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and the other eugenicists that were living around that time when abortion was just starting to come to fruition, that's how they saw it. They saw birth control, you know, the, the pill and everything else, And on top of that, also abortion, based on which thinker that you're reading about there, they saw both of those as a way to create a master race. Remember that a lot of Hitler's influence in creating a race of thoroughbreds came from people like Margaret Sanger. In fact, the race of thoroughbreds line that I just used came from her. That's a reference to her. And so... This idea that we were going to root out the human weeds, again, Margaret Sanger's words, not mine. The way that we were going to do that by getting rid of the Jews and blacks. And again, I'm I'm trying, I know I'm saying this and I sound like a broken record. These are all Margaret Sanger's ideas, not mine. I'm just quoting her. The way that we were going to get rid of those human weeds, as she called them, was through birth control. And one of the classes of undesirables that she talked about ad nauseum was people that were not mentally competent, that weren't, you know, that had special needs or whatever it was. And that's something that carried over into this science of trying to craft a 
a perfect race, a perfect utopia that is populated only with certain people is that there was forcible sterilization. Again, something that Margaret Sanger was a big fan of forcible sterilization of certain parts of the population to help weed them out. That was the original plan behind Planned Parenthood. That was the original goal. And they really haven't abandoned it. There's a reason that abortions affect black people far more than white people. Even though they only represent about 15 is generous, it's more like 13 or 14% of the population that black people account for uh, roughly 35 to 40% of all abortions. It disproportionately affects especially poor people and especially minorities. And so Planned Parenthood is essentially doing the bidding of their founder, Margaret Sanger, long after she's been gone. And you have to understand that that was the original purpose of a lot of the eugenics that was going on in Europe that coincided with Nazi Germany, the Weimar Republic, all the things that were going on there. You remember that they didn't go after the Jews first. They didn't go after the gays or the communists or the capitalists and all the other people they disagreed with first. They started with disabled people and elderly people. Baby Nauer, a severely deformed baby that had just been born, was the first victim of Nazism. And so this idea that we ought to be weeding out certain people because they're not mentally proficient enough or not or too far below average when you're talking about mental performance, that's a eugenicist idea. And by the way, this is not a ideology that has died out. Now, of course, you saw that displayed with John Rogers. But it's not even just here in Alabama or one, you know, the long term republic or long term representative that's been in office forever. They've also pretty much wiped out Down syndrome in Iceland, not because they found a cure for Down syndrome, because they're able to test early on whether or not a child is going to have syndro uh, Down syndrome. And they're just killing all the children in the womb before they are born so that they don't have to deal with a child with Down syndrome, which is so evil on a number of levels. If you've ever actually had a relationship with somebody that is special needs, and, and Down syndrome, of course, being a part of that, it, it's impossible in my mind, and maybe there are exceptions, but it's impossible in my mind to know somebody like that and to spend a certain amount of time with them and then not see their value as a human being. And that's essentially the idea that encircles the eugenicist roots of abortion, that there are certain people that are not fit to live. And because of that, we have to go ahead and weed them out. But that assumes that that person is not as valuable as people that have more mental capabilities than them. But you cannot quantify human life's value that way. It can't be done. And when looking back and, and looking at the looking at, at some of the relationships that I've had with people that are special needs, they are some of the kindest, sweetest people that would never hurt a fly. And I mean, just looking back at that and, and people that are saying that you shouldn't be allowed to live because you're not mentally capable as I am. Well, if that's the case, then what would be wrong with somebody that has an IQ of 140 or 150 someday saying, you know what, you people that only have an IQ of about 120, 117, 115, yeah, we can't allow you to live. You're just not up to my level. You cannot quantify the value of a person's life like that. And to treat certain people as less valuable and to treat them as subhuman and people that you ought to be able to just eliminate because they're not as mentally capable as you. Although in Roger's case, I'm guessing there's not too many people that rank below him on the mental capacity scale. Uh, in Roger's case, you, you would think somebody that was a black person, especially would have a little more sympathy for that. For this idea that, there are certain people that just aren't as valuable as others, and we ought to be able to do what we want to with them because we're superior. That is the height of cruelty and evil. 
And what John Roberts is saying here, and, and I will say that this is also very telling. And I said John Roberts, that's the chief justice of the Supreme Court, John Rogers, sorry. It's very telling that there are now some on the left that are decrying him. And here's why. It's the same thing that we saw with Governor Northam and a whole bunch of people on the left getting really angry that he had donned blackface when he was in college. It's the same thing, and I'll tell you why. Because this is a man who just advocated for literal infanticide, not even abortion. We're saying after the baby has already been born, then the doctor and the mother are going to have a conversation about whether or not they're going to kill the child or not. And again, I played that clip on here. You can go look it up. You can go look up that interview. It's everywhere. Don't take my word for it. That's what he said. That's what he said should happen, is that that conversation about whether or not we should let the baby live or kill it should take place. And so I think it's very telling that the left didn't care about that. That's fine. But all of a sudden, when we find out that he wore blackface in college, oh, well, now we're upset. You're talking about slaughtering children that have already been born. And you're really upset because the guy wore insensitive face makeup. I'm not trying to belittle that or say that that's no big deal. I'm just saying that when you're comparing the two, one involves life and death for potentially millions of people. The other is an offensive picture that he took. Now, we're both wrong, sure, but there is a argument of degrees here. And that's exactly what happened the other day with John Rogers. There were some people very upset with him for making this statement. Not bec uh, and I'm talking about people on the left. Not because the other day he said that, well, you have to kill babies now or kill them in the electric chair later, whichever, so you might as well go ahead and kill them now. Weren't upset with him over that. When he was talking in that interview about the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., regardless of what you think about the president or his son, I think that we're a little bit better than suggesting that anybody that disagrees with me or is on the opposite side of the political spectrum of me ought to be executed. Regardless of how you feel about that, you would think that there would be some people on the left that say, look, I don't like Donald Trump Jr., but I don't want the guy to have been aborted just because I don't like him. No, they didn't do that. The only reason that a lot of the people on the left came and said, nope, that's a bridge too far, is because he used the word retarded. Now, I'm going to say something that I know is a little bit controversial here. I'm not somebody that thinks that the word retarded ought to be completely eliminated from the lexicon just because at its roots, it's completely benign. If you know the Latin roots of the word retarded, it just means something that is slow. For example, in the Latin term, because of course Italian is the language of music, that when they say that they're going to slow the melody or slow the pace of the song, they say it's a retardation. I'm an ag guy. I have a degree in agriculture. One of the things that we would do is if we were observing a plant and it wasn't growing at the pace that it was supposed to, in other words, it had not grown to the level that it should have by that point in its life cycle, we said that was a, a plant that's growth had been retarded. And so when people in the medical community, and this is a appropriate medical term, would say that somebody's mental capabilities are a little bit slower than the average person's or their brain had not developed to the level that it should have for their age, they said that was a mentally retarded person. Wasn't offensive, wasn't meant to degrade anyone. It was just to say their mental functions are not to the level of their physical age. That's all it meant. And so because of that and understanding that there are people that don't mean it in a degrading way, that aren't trying to insinuate anything or say anything negative about people that are mentally challenged. I don't think that necessarily if they use the phrase retarded, that they are committing some kind of great crime. However, in John Rogers case, he was specifically using it as an insult in the worst possible way. And not just using it as an insult to Donald Trump Jr., but saying that because he was retarded, 
that he ought to be killed before he was born and not even given the chance to live. So that, yes, I do find offensive. But if we're comparing the two and we're talking about a argument of degrees here, using the word retarded is pretty benign compared to the way that he used the word retarded, specifically to degrade and belittle someone that he did not like. And also using that as an excuse for saying, and he ought to be killed because of that. Because of course the implication there is, if it's okay to kill someone because you feel that they're going to be retarded, and that is, as John Rogers said, his strongest case, his strongest defense for having abortion legal and, and part of the institution here. Well, then what he's saying is that people that are mentally challenged ought to be killed. I don't think you can get more offensive than that. And as far as being somebody that tries to in his daily life, especially stick up for those that are innocent or those that cannot defend themselves, there are very few people that are more innocent and would be have a more difficult time defending themselves than those that are mentally challenged and have special needs. And there is no one more innocent or has more trouble defending themselves than children living inside the womb. But really looking at, at Rogers and the reaction that the left had and that they only really had a problem with him using the word retarded really does say something about them and their priorities. But the bottom line here is, that the Democrats engage in the height of cruelty, the elimination of innocent life. And they do this and feel justified in it because it's a sanitized cruelty. And this is really a big indication of that, that don't you dare say something politically incorrect or call someone retarded, but if you do want to kill them for being mentally challenged, that's perfectly acceptable. It makes no sense. But as long as it makes them feel good and it does not offend their sensibilities, they're perfectly okay with it. No matter what the result is, they would rather children be murdered in the womb than somebody say, oh, that person is retarded because they feel it might offend someone. Offense to them has become a bigger deal than the literal life and death. It's a sad place to be. So we'll go ahead and go to the Daily Dose of Stupid. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. Today's Daily Dose of Stupid, it's one of those situations where there's an awful lot of stupid. But I think that primarily this goes to the American left because of the way that they've treated Venezuela for so long and the way that it has really blown up in their face. So for those of you that aren't aware, Venezuela is currently going through a crisis where they are trying to fight between the president that was duly elected and actually won the election. His name I can't really pronounce. It's Gudio or something like that. It starts with a G. I have a really hard time pronouncing names as anybody that came by and watched me read the Bible today in, in first Kings or sorry, um, second Kings quickly understood <laughs> that I'm not good with names. This is nothing but a big list of names, but anyway, so what has happened in Venezuela is that they have essentially erupted into clashes between uh, protesters and people on the streets because the rightful president of Venezuela and the guy who actually won the election uh, has been kept out of office by the former president, Nicolas Maduro, because he has refused to accept the fact that he lost an election and he has essentially tried to barricade himself and, and try to make himself by force the permanent president of Venezuela. And there's a couple things that you really need to understand about the story and the way that Venezuela has fallen because the, this whole thing started because Venezuela is in very, very bad shape. And Maduro, Chavez, both avowed socialists, talk about socialism, said that socialism was what inspired them and their governance style. And they got exactly what they wanted. They got socialism. They did everything by the socialist handbook. I mean, verbatim, 
they implemented socialist policies, and now they're living in a country where people are literally digging through garbage and waiting in line for three hours to get a can of beans and a roll of toilet paper. This is the plight that they find themselves in. And it really is a shame because Venezuela has amazing natural resources. There is no reason Venezuela really should be in this situation because Venezuela is the most oil-rich nation on Earth. More than the United States, more than Saudi Arabia. They have, you know, based on their land mass, more oil than any other nation. And yet, they're still suffering. They still can't get all this together. They also have gorgeous tropical shorelines, which, you know, theoretically would be a great tourist attraction. They have ports. They have a, a place that they can actually transport goods and services on the ocean. They have a mild climate, which, by the way, their climate is actually so good that they have year-round production. They have year-round agricultural production. And there are states in the United States that don't even have that. There are certain parts of this country where production is very limited. Not so in Venezuela. The entire country of Venezuela has essentially a year-round growing season that they can grow more or less whatever they want anytime they want. Obviously, there's going to be some restrictions on that. But by and large, they have the resources to grow crops just about year-round. And not only do they have the climate for it, they also have abundant water resources. They have a little bit of a dry season, but they also have really nutritious soil. And their soil has been classified as, as extremely good if you're comparing it agriculturally to other nations. And so there is no reason for their country to be starving when they have all of this made available to them basically any time they want it. And so this is really the, the problem that they run into is that despite having all these resources, despite having so much advantages compared to other nations, they're still falling to pieces. And the only explanation is the government has royally screwed this thing up. The government has essentially destroyed what should have been a bustling Latin American economy. And people have lost on average about 25 pounds in the past couple of years. And... I mean, you can look at the people, you can look at pictures of them in, in the past and look at them now. A lot of these people are walking around looking like skeletons. There are gangs of boys living on the street because it's the only way that they can find food and literally getting into large gang brawls over territory to s dig through garbage to find food. And this isn't me editorializing. These are reports that were done by the New York Times that we're seeing these roaming gangs of, of teenage and, and sort of preteen boys that were fighting each other for territory to dig through the garbage on that side of the street. That's how bad it's gotten in Venezuela. They've also, like I said, been waiting in line for sometimes up to three and four hours just for one can of beans and a roll of toilet paper. They're also reverting to eating dogs and zoo animals. They, they had zoos in Venezuela, and now they've said that a lot of those zoo animals have been killed and eaten by the civilians that snuck in and stole the, the different animals from different places because they're so hungry. And another thing, too, the infant mortality rate has been skyrocketing because hospitals have no diapers or formula. And this is unfortunately a common thing. I, I think that uh, I did a very in-depth report on this about a year, year and a half ago, that the infant mortality rate had gone really bad to where there were reports of in the ER about half of the children coming in were coming in with problems associated with malnutrition. And the hospitals weren't able to help because they didn't have any baby formula. They didn't have any diapers. They had no supplies. And in the medical system that they had, they were having a hard time getting drugs, gauze, and I'm talking about really standard stuff like penicillin. And there's nothing that the hospitals can do because the government provides all their medical supplies and the government isn't providing anything. And so it really is a messed up system and a great testament to how bad uh, socialism really is. And then, of course, video surfaced the other day of civilians in Venezuela that are involved in this struggle between the president that was elected and Nicolas Maduro. 
that the military has been shooting at civilians and running over them with tanks. That's what they've resorted to because of how bad everything has gotten that when these crowds of protesters show up, that they're just flat running over them with their tanks and shooting into the crowd indiscriminately. It really is a sad situation, and yet the American left has been propping up Venezuela for years as something that we could follow as an example, a great testament to the glory of, of how socialism really can be. This was their big shining example. They lauded praise on Chavez and Maduro. By the way, speaking of that, Bernie Sanders back in the day was praising Castro and Cuba and talked about how Venezuela was up and coming and that Venezuela was going to be basically the next socialist utopia. And then, of course, all of this happened, but he didn't really abandon it, or at least not nearly as quickly as he should have, because he said in a 2011 editorial. Now, remember, this is 2011. This is eight years ago. We're talking about the Obama administration. We're not talking about like the, the 80s or 70s. This is recent history that Bernie Sanders said in an editorial, and this is a quote that Venezuela is a place where, quote, the American dream is more apt to be realized. So he was saying that the Venezuelans are more likely to have the American dream realized. Now, how you define that is a little different. I don't know. Maybe Bernie Sanders thinks that food lines actually are the American dream. And he basically said that in a 19, I think it was 1987, 88 interview. So maybe it's just that Bernie Sanders and I have a very different idea of what the American dream was. But I guess when Bernie Sanders is saying that this is where the American dream is supposed to be realized, I guess if your dream was not owning a car and your children leaving your home because they're going to fight in, in gangs so that they can dig through garbage in certain parts of the town, well, then maybe if that's the American dream, then yeah, that's exactly what's going on here. By the way, this editorial was up on Bernie Sanders' website today. It hadn't been taken down yet. And he wrote it in 2011. The thing is, Bernie Sanders can say all he wants to about, oh, Venezuela, that's not, not a real example of socialism. But you were saying it was a real example of socialism. You were saying it was the gold standard. You were saying that this was the system that was going to work and it's the example that we ought to be following and then when it falls to pieces, then all of a sudden, oh, well, it, that, that wasn't real socialism. Well, then what is? And that's what the thing that's so hilarious about this. The only examples that he was able to come up with now, able to come up with recently, would be some of the Scandinavian countries. And even the Scandinavian countries told Bernie to shut up because we are a market economy. That's what they said to Bernie. But Bernie Sanders apparently still trying to hang on to this thing of, well, Venezuela is not real socialism, even though you called it real socialism and praised them for what they were doing just eight years ago. And Sean Penn and other people in Hollywood, Sean Penn actually spoke at Chavez's funeral and praised Nicolas Maduro. I mean, that isn't that long ago. And you can see all of these people on the left that have been specifically praising Venezuela for years beforehand, and then when crap hits the fan, they try to abandon it and say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not real socialism. But, but you said it was real socialism. That's not me putting words in your mouth. That's what you said. Why is it all of a sudden not real socialism? And this is what always happens with socialism. It works for a little while. It works for a little while. And then, as Margaret Thatcher said, Eventually, they run out of other people's money. Eventually, people that are not incentivized to work stop working. People that have no motivation to improve themselves or to improve the status of their lives through the free market and through capitalism, they see no reason to work. Because why should they? And when that happens, you start running out of other people's money and government mismanages the resources because they always do. It, there, the market is so much efficiently and does for free what government has to be very big and bloated and cost a lot of money for the government to try to do in regulation. And so, inevitably, what always happens is you get Venezuela. If you continue to follow socialism far enough down the road, 
you eventually get socialism. When you're talking about countries like Finland and Denmark and Norway, they all built their economies, which were very strong and very reliable, on markets, then started moving in a socialist direction, realized it was a bad idea, and now are backing off of socialism because they're realizing the detrimental effects it had on the economy. They're moving away from that. Venezuela didn't do that. Venezuela started on the road of socialism, saw the warning signs, said, screw that, we're going to drive right past them, and did, and this is where they ended up. At a place where their civilians are being shot at by the government and run over by tanks. And this happens in every socialist society. It happened in the USSR, it's happened in China. How many times do you have to see this thing fail to say, maybe it's not a good idea? Maybe we should be trying something else. If you've ever seen the B-movie, there's a scene in B-movie, it's, it's a goofy kids movie and Jerry Seinfeld plays a bee. And they're making fun of the way that bees will just kind of smack their head against things like a, a window because they don't know that the window is there. And so Jerry Seinfeld goes up to the window, his character, and he goes, uh, flies right into the window. He's like, that's weird. It's like there's something there. And then he says, maybe this time, this time, this time, this time. And he keeps smacking his head against this window thinking, this time, somehow the window won't be there. That's essentially what socialists do. That They say, oh, well, that wasn't real socialism. It's never been tried correctly. And then no matter how many times it fails, whether you're talking about Mao or Castro or Pol Pot or whatever else, no matter how many times it fails, they constantly say, no, 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 you don't understand. This time it's going to work. And it never does. It's failed every single time it's ever been tried. Venezuela is just the latest example in a very long line of the failures of socialism. And, and we hear this so much that that isn't real socialism. And the excuse will always be, well, we want democratic socialism. Yet yeah, Chavez and Maduro were democratically elected. Both of them. They went through an election. The people said, yep, we want socialism. And they got Chavez and they got Maduro. And this still happened. The idea that because people agree on something or because we vote on something that automatically means the system is going to work, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. A lot of people agree on things and that doesn't make it a good idea. Just because you're saying, well, we want socialism that we vote for socialism, they voted for socialism and now they're digging through garbage trying to find food. They voted for socialism and now their children are dying because the mothers can't produce enough milk to sustain them and they have no baby formula. This is what's going on here. And it happens the same way every single time. And to anybody, if you get into this discussion with somebody and they say, well, Venezuela wasn't real socialism. Here's the question that you need to ask them. Which of Chavez or Maduro's policies do you disagree with? It's a simple question, and I've never gotten a, an actual answer from anybody on the left that talks about this. Which one of their policies do you think screwed it up and made it not real socialism? Because it seems what's going on here is they fall prey to the, non, uh, the no true Scotsman logical fallacy, essentially claiming that because it didn't work, that's what made it not socialism. Well, no, socialism has a very clear defined term. It is a economic system where the government takes hold of the means of production. That's the way socialism functions. That's what socialism is. And so if you're saying that it wasn't real socialism, okay, explain to me why it wasn't real socialism. And by the way, while you're there, which of these policies that made it not real socialism would you have disagreed with? Was it taking control of the oil industry? Because they did that. Was it uh, raising the minimum wage and making a big point about uh, everybody has to have a job because they did that too? Is it printing money like crazy so that people can have more money because they did that one as well? Like, which of these policies are you against? Is it free education? Any of the things that they're talking about, free health care, all of that stuff. Have them actually name the policy that they disagree with. And not, I've never run into anybody that could actually answer that question, honestly. Never have. And another thing that you may want to bring up, too, 
is that wages in Venezuela are very high. They're very high. They're making a lot of money. But the money doesn't mean much when the grocery store, uh, store shelves are basically empty. When you've got literally 1 million percent inflation, and that's not me, again, uh, embellishing, they literally have 1 million percent inflation. So one dollar, I know they don't use dollars, I'm just making it an easier transition here. That would be like if that happened in the United States, that one dollar is equal to one million dollars. So in other words, a cookie or a candy bar in a vending machine would be one million dollars. Well, does it really matter if your wages are high if you can't buy food? If you've got a lot of money, like you have a bunch of physical dollar bills, but that money doesn't buy anything, if it costs you, uh, you know, three and a half million dollars to buy a loaf of bread, why does it matter to you whether or not you're a millionaire? See, that's the problem with constantly saying, well, we need to raise the minimum wage. We need to make sure that wages are good. This this stuff that they're doing now, there's wage slavery. The government needs to mandate that the businesses pay more. You can't just make wealth out of nothing. You can't just print. I mean, you can print money, but you can't make the value of that money stay stagnant. And so, yeah, we could print money until the end of time. We could have it to where you're making a million dollars an hour. But if that million dollars doesn't even buy a loaf of bread, then what good does it do you? And that's exactly what's happening here in Venezuela. And one other thing that I want to mention before we move on. Another lesson that should be thought about here is that Venezuela also did one other thing that I've never heard a liberal argue with or say was wrong. And yet we see the results of it right here. And that's they disarmed their citizens. Happened in the USSR, happened in Nazi Germany. It's happened in every socialist system that has ever been tried. It's one of the hallmarks of it. Adolf Hitler himself said, uh, well, I, I say that. I think this is Hitler. It may be Lenin, but I'm pretty sure this was Hitler. You know, two sides of the same coin there. But anyway, they said, uh, um, idea, uh, guns are much, or what was it? Ideas are much more um, dangerous than guns. If we will not allow them to have guns, why do you think that we would allow them to have ideas? And that's really the the bottom line here is that they don't want the people thinking for themselves. They think that government should control everything that a bunch of really benevolent, smart guys who turn out to be neither all that smart or all that benevolent, benevolent, that they're at the top, that they're controlling everything, that they're dictating to the people how they're supposed to live. And because of that, they don't want them having guns because you can't have them having guns. They might get their own ideas. They might hurt themselves. They treat them like cattle, really. You don't want to give your livestock anything that might hurt themselves because they're just a bunch of dumb animals that can't handle it. And that's really the mentality that comes from here. They disarmed their population. And now that population is having a hard time fighting back against Maduro because he has tanks and a military with guns. Now, for those people that say, well, what, do you think that if they had guns that it would make a difference with these tanks? Yes, I do. And here's why. Maduro is barely hanging on. I mean, hanging on by the skin of his teeth to keep protesters with rocks at bay. Are you really going to sit there and tell me that a population with guns wouldn't do a lot better? Are you really going to sit there and tell me that if these people had guns, if they were well armed, that they wouldn't already have taken Maduro out of his place of power, which again, he's now the illegitimate president of Venezuela because the legitimate president won the election. He hasn't been, that transfer of power hasn't taken yet. Maduro would already be done by this point if they had guns. Sure, the military has tanks and they have guns too, but it's a lot different when you're facing an armed populace. You see, that's one of the reasons that even if, just for the sake of argument, President Obama had tried to become a tyrant and overstayed his welcome, or if Trump tried to do that whenever his term is up. Do you know why I'm not worried about that? 
because 30% of all households in America have guns. And we have almost as many guns as we have people. So no, I'm not real worried about someone becoming tyrannical because we have the Second Amendment. Because we have that ability to fight back. Because an armed resistance is way more difficult to fight than an armed resistance. And what's hilarious is there was a clip from the other day that even the people at MSNBC admitted to that. I don't know if they were doing it consciously or they were just observing and, and sort of not really thinking about the political fallout of what they were saying. But on MSNBC, one of their anchors the other day was saying, when you're watching that scene unfold on video, well, you have to understand here, they aren't able to, they don't have guns. And so they're using whatever resources they have fighting the military the way that they are. He did. I don't even know that he realized he was making an excellent case for the Second Amendment. And let's all remember that that was the purpose of the Second Amendment in the first place. Because in the same way that Venezuela unarmed their citizens with common sense gun control, in the same way that they did that, the left seeks to undo that, and here's why. And this is really sort of the thing that, that brings it all together. Those that are on the left and the proponents of big government, they are terrified of independent people. And I'm not even just talking about independent thinkers, even though that terrifies them too. I'm talking about people that are self-sufficient, that can take care of themselves, and do not need the government to help them. The reason that people that are fans of big government and centralized control like a generous welfare state and like a lot of people not working and actually being dependent upon the government for their food, for their medical care, for their just general payment, for their housing... All of these different things, the reason that big people in big government like as many people on those programs as possible is because those people are the ones that they can bribe into votes. It is very, very difficult to win over the vote of somebody that is taking care of themselves by saying, but I can give you all this stuff. And you're sitting there thinking, but I can get all that stuff myself and I can do it a lot better than you can. See, that's the difference. It's very hard to win over a person with promises of things when the person is already providing the things for themselves. And the same holds true with guns. The people on the other side of the gun debate are essentially saying, turn over your guns to us. You have police officers. We have a military. You don't really have to have a gun for your own personal protection. We'll take care of that. And the independent-minded person is thinking, well, why would I want that when I can just protect myself? Because there may not always be a cop or somebody else in authority around. I'm always going to be around. And so when it comes to the protection of me and my family, I want to do that on my own. When it comes to feeding my family and providing for them and, and getting a nice house for them and everything else, I'll just do that on my own. See, it's much harder to bribe somebody that's independent that doesn't need the government to give things to them. And so because of that, the left seeks to constantly make you as dependent on government as humanly possible. And people on the right, and I'm not even talking about Republicans, I'm saying specifically people on the right, all they're saying is, you go out, get it yourself. That's fine. More power to you. They want to empower the individual. And what they're saying is, we'll handle the government, you take care of your own life, and we'll trust that you will make the right decisions for you and your family when it comes to that. It really is a difference in worldview. Let's go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today does continue the series that we began in the book of Daniel. And just to give you a little bit of background or refresher on what's happening, King Belshazzar has held a great feast and he ordered all the vessels that had been obtained by his father when he raided the temples in Jerusalem. In other words, God's temple that he had raided, all of the vessels that were supposed to be used in the worship of God, he now calls them out to be used to serve drinks for him and his guests. 
And so there's no respect whatsoever for the sanctity of these items. And he's specifically kind of, I don't even know if he's doing it intentionally, but he's certainly being flippant and apathetic about God. And he's kind of, you know, putting a middle finger up to God and saying that I, I can use these things for my own benefit. And then we see a hand write a message on a wall. And he doesn't understand what's going on there. He doesn't understand what the message says. Nobody can interpret it. He calls in his magicians. They don't know what it says. And the queen remembers something. She says, there was this guy that back when your father was king, he always used to handle all the interpretations of dreams and all these mysteries that nobody else could understand. Somehow he always got them. And so King Belshazzar says, all right, bring him in. And Daniel looks at the... Uh, the writing in Belshazzar says, I will give you all of these wonderful things and all this power and prestige if you'll just read this translation and interpret it from me. And Daniel says, ah, don't worry about that. You can give the rewards to somebody else or keep them for yourself. But you asked me to do it and you are the king, so I'll go ahead and, and make the interpretation known to you. And we really see the follow-up of that and we see the results of that in this next passage in Daniel chapter 5 verses 25 through 28. Now this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharison. Uh, up this is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has been numbered. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. Looking at what's about to happen, and of course we do know from hindsight that that is exactly what happens. In fact, if you were to look a little further down into that passage, you would see that that very night, the night that Daniel makes this translation known to the king, that the king is slaughtered, and King Darius, who is a Mede, takes his place and takes over his empire. So it didn't take very long for this prophecy to be fulfilled. But I want you to notice something in that writing. God very clearly sets out a cause and effect relationship between the king's behavior and what happens to him in life. And so, because he establishes this, and it's something that ought to be easy for Christians to understand, he's saying, you didn't humble yourself like your father did. Your father was raised up in pride and, and wound up living amongst the beasts. And you're doing the same thing despite seeing this, despite seeing his example, despite seeing what happens when you defy God. You chose to do it anyway. You chose to just ignore that and to do what you wanted to. And because of that, this is the verdict that God has written on the wall for him to understand. So God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. In other words, God is looking at your kingdom your days are numbered, and God is going to put an end to the Babylonian Empire to make way for the Medes and the Persians. And then the second part of that, which is, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Because he had been given every opportunity to not live out the example of his father, to follow God and to devote himself to the one true God of the universe. He had that ability. He had that option. He chose to ignore it. And because of that, God weighed him on the scales and he was found not worthy. That ought to be a terrifying verse to all of us. Because we all know that eventually we are going to face a similar judgment. That God is going to set us upon the scales of his judgment. And we may be found efficient. And the only way to be found efficient, in other words, the only way to be placed on the scales of justice as a flawed human being and to be found worthy to be in God's sight and to be in his presence and to enter into his kingdom is if God's not seeing us. Is if what's really happening here is that when God makes that judgment, we have been washed and cleansed in the blood of Christ. That's the only way that we're going to be placed on the scales of judgment 
and not be found deficient, is that what's actually being weighed is Christ's love for us, not what we've done in this life. But God here is saying that when it comes to this guy, his actions are not worthy of mercy. His actions have not proven himself worthy. He has been found deficient in the way that he lived his life. And so there's a very clear, like I said, cause and effect relationship here. Because he has been found deficient, this is what God is going to do. And this is something that is really common in the biblical narrative. We don't really see God in the way that a lot of atheists would like to think of him. In other words, God just thumping people because he doesn't like them. That doesn't really happen. What does happen a lot is that God either punishes someone directly because of actions that they have done, or he kind of steps back and allows them to fall victim of their own circumstances. For example, I don't know that God is specifically moving the Medes and the Persians to come in and to take the kingdom away from King Belshazzar. But it may be that God is just not going to protect him because of what he's done, and because of that, these guys are going to come in, and because of bad decisions that Belshazzar made, he is going to fall victim of his own incompetence, his own inadequacy as a human being. And that seems to be what is actually going to happen here. But I want you to notice the progression and how we got to this point. God gave him a warning and gave him ample time to change. He gave him a warning in the, the form of his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, that he saw what God did to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar had lifted up his heart in pride and arrogance and refused to humble himself. And even though Belshazzar saw that, he still ignored the warning signs. And so God gave him plenty of opportunity. But let's also ask this question. Why did he put the writing on the wall? What was the purpose of that? It doesn't seem to be something that helps Daniel because even though Daniel may not have known it immediately and when it was going to happen and known all the details at the time, Daniel's about to be under a completely different administration. King Belshazzar is not going to be around anymore. So we can't really say that this was something kind of like the dream interpretation that God allowed Daniel to do to help Daniel improve his status. We can't really say that because that very night, the only people that would have seen him do this are no longer going to be in power. And so I contend, and I think that this is a fair assumption, and it is an assumption. I don't have any scripture to specifically back this up. But I think what's going on here is God is giving Belshazzar one last chance. He is performing this miracle in hopes that Belshazzar is going to see this and Belshazzar is going to say, oh man, I really did mess up here. I didn't listen to God's warning at all. I really need to turn my life around and fix this. But he doesn't do it. There is no indication in the scripture that Belshazzar took this seriously and even after having seen this miracle, turned his life around and apologized to God and repented of his sins. And who knows, maybe if he had done that, his life would have been spared, or he would have had some kind of reward in the afterlife. But we're given no indication at all that Belshazzar even felt a hint of remorse after hearing God that he had been found unworthy on the scales of justice. And that really is a sad existence to have. There is no indication whatsoever that he repented of his sins. And if that should be a lesson to us in any way, we should remember this. God gives people chances. Don't let them pass by. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.